The Oklahoma summer is a thing of cruel perfection. It is cauldron hot and all but solitary trees die under the sun's relentless exhalations of radiation. In accordance with the clear will of God, the good people of Edmond, Oklahoma built endless warrens of suburbs punctuated only by halls of commerce or worship. And it is through those cul-de-sac mazes of adequately constructed houses that my high school bandmates and I lugged our gear back and forth, back and forth from one unit to the next. I played bass and I was the lyricist and singer of the group. Trent, our guitarist, was still not driving at this time and Danny the drummer had his kit a mile up the road. I was always a year younger than everyone else, so hauling gear across those beveled plains of neighborhood streets was the price we paid to be rockers. It was 1996 and all of us knew every word to every Tool album. Marilyn Manson was still terrifying, and I lived in my interview with the vampire, the movie, T-shirt. <laughs> we only played one proper show, and it absolutely had to have been Trent's idea to play the Battle of the Bands at Edmond Santa Fe High School. I named the band Bliss in the Abyss. And at 13, I thought doing that proved that I was wickedly clever. <laughs> For as ridiculous as that name is, though, the Edmond City Police years later used the code name of Cult of the Black Rose to describe my friend circle. So who really was cringe? Now, you might at this point think that my bandmates and I were the bad kids. And while we certainly knew some, no, we were not the bad kids. But oh, we were the weird kids. <laughs> David Lynch and Cronenberg movie nights helped make sense of our use of the shockingly good LSD running through Oklahoma City at that time. But Dare had so thoroughly convinced me that psychedelics would eviscerate my mind that I spent 20 minutes working algebra problems after I came down from my first trip. <laughs> I had to assure myself that my college-bound brain could still fire. <laughs> Bad kids are usually crying for help. We the weird were desperate for escape. Trent was stocky and short, and when we first met in the sixth grade, he was obsessed with GNR and any book with dragons in it. We bonded hard and fast. He was also the younger brother of an Olympic gymnast, the pride of the town and state, and his mother tried to have that shadow reach to the edge of the horizon over him. Danny and I were both from the classic late boomer broken homes, with Danny doing the suburban shuffle from mom's to dad's place. He was naturally athletic, strikingly handsome, and had it occurred to him to try, he could have fit in. But he adored art class too much. His every sketch a love note to the Alien movies. <laughs> that meant he hung out with us. <laughs> And as for me, my Vietnam vet stepfather, or dad number three, had shown up when I was 11 with a singular mission to pour his grown, broken man's trauma and anger into my stick-thin frame under the auspices of toughening me up. But I loved poetry and math. <laughs> and the more I excelled academically, the more my stepfather resented me for it. We all eventually find our own ways out, but whatever escape Danny sought ran into the cries of his first child, which he fathered at 18. Then there were the years of struggles with painkillers that bind reluctant hearts to the hostile soil of lands that time and society would rather forget. And Oklahoma City with its little Edmond suburb was a confusing and vicious place whose violence ran in rivers throughout the lifeless red brick earth under our young feet. 
By the time I was 15, I knew to be ready for the screech of tires, followed by some ragged shit kicker leaping limbs akimbo from his truck, ready to pound my queer ass into that worthless awkward dirt. Or it was jocks leaping out of their parent purchased Mustangs to tell us much the same. Best of all, it was my stepfather leaning in low and lover close to let me know that he would put my right cheek on the left side of my face for daring to imagine that I was man enough to challenge him. <laughs> to his credit, his simmering fury was so visceral, stalking the line between the violent and the erotic, that it made the remaining violence of my days look insipid in contrast. My only refuge among adults was the small but desperately vital network of protective teachers who nurtured us and pointed to the escape hatches. They let us know that we were not repugnant and hell-bound half-humans despite what Baptist preachers said on any given Sunday morning. This, then, is the milieu that gave rise to Edmund's very own bliss in the abyss. We made a t-shirt and four track recordings <laughs> and four track recordings with Trent's hand-drawn colored pencil sketched covers of us as our preferred D&D characters. <laughs> I was a lightning shooting elf wizard. I was always an elf wizard. Though through the influence of my bestie's father, I was also obsessed with Ginsburg and Burroughs, which I tried to copy in my lyrics. That is to say that we were a goofy hodgepodge of far too many influences that could never fit on the same creative plate together. But the band gave us the otherwise putative universal targets of that Christo-fascist suburban dreamscape, a voice, and surprisingly, an edge. We intuitively understood playing heavy music, and we quickly moved on to originals, because fuck that, covers were for posers, and we were artists. <laughs> Ginsburg quoting elf wizard artists, but artists just the same. Again, it had to have been Trent's idea to play the battle of the bands. There is no way that I had his nerve and confidence. And anyway, he was furiously driven to prove to his family that he was not messing around. So it has to have been his plan. But Christ, we were really weird. <laughs> the other bands knew to play anything else but originals and anything else but whatever it was that we played. And never mind what we sounded like. As a 95 pounds wind wet, five foot 10 teenager, my hair was so ethereally blonde that despite keeping it long in a desperate attempt to look metal, it was so fine that it naturally curled back up into a weightless feathering set of angelic head wings. There was no amount of camo cutoffs and scuffed Doc Martens that could ever make me look hard. <laughs> and I was the face and voice of the band. Given the cultural ladder rung on which we lived and the miasma of judgment and violence forming the backdrop of our lives, maybe Trent just knew that we had nothing else to lose. They got the football team to do security for the show. <laughs> this is Oklahoma. So anything and everything football is seen as such unassailable quality that nobody for a moment thought it, that it was a terrible idea. <laughs> Yellow shirts fitting snug over gym cultured muscle, the soon to be thick necked high school heroes exerted their dollop of authority across the crowd. Before Bliss in the Abyss took the stage was the one other metal act. They played no perfect Metallica covers to solid applause from an otherwise respectful audience. It also clearly got the testosterone of the security raging. As we were setting up, the one football player friend I had, James, asked me if we were fucking heavy. 
Without a shred of irony, my angel-winged head nodded yes. Yes, we were heavy. We routinely faced down small-minded hillbillies, idiotically religious fanatics, and abusive parents, and we were ready to step up and melt some faces. James let me know that he would get the crowd going for us. I did not know what he meant. <laughs> but he had that air about him of someone who knows what they are doing. He was my friend, and I was terrified at what we were about to do. So cool, dude. Thanks. We plugged in and started. Somehow, I could play bass and scream lyrics at the same time then, and I did so till I shook. Trent and Danny basically did the same. My wispy filigree hair wrapped around my eyes and blinded me to the crowd. One song down, next starting, and I still cannot see what is in front of me. The notes I played right, uh, though I was garbling every other word of the lyrics, but who could tell? It might have been the second song or the third, but I finally lifted my head quickly enough to whip back my hair from my eyes. And there before me, swirling to my screeching pubescent voice was pure chaos. A maelstrom of bodies punctuated by yellow shirts wreaking havoc. The jocks had instigated a full-on mosh pit with the rest of crowd in tow. And they were all just going nuts to the dorkiest band with the even dorkier singer desperately hanging on for dear life on that stage. And let me be clear, it was divine. <laughs> we were rock gods, and in that moment, I was changed forever. <laughs> it all lasted a minute, perhaps two. And then because this was a high school, a cop jumped up on stage and started to shut us down. We didn't even realize it was happening until we couldn't hear anything coming from our amps. The last thing to go down was my mic and my teenage brilliance, frenziedly realizing I had only moments to say my last words. I declared with maximum gusto or humility that rock and roll will never die. <laughs> Fuck, I got made fun of for that. <laughs> Repeatedly. <laughs> After that moment of jock-led total Armageddon had passed, of course I returned to being the effeminate nerd whose only other claim to fame was ruining exam curves. <laughs> it was not my lot in life to be the keeper of the burning flame of rock. But when I got home from the Battle of the Bands, still glowing, my stepfather asked me how it had gone. When I told him, the monster that lurked through my house laughed. That bastard was proud of me, impressed even. I think he suddenly had some vision of me slinging guitar in a seedy dive bar with beer bottles flying past my head. Frankly, it might have been one of the first times that he felt that he could relate with me in terms he understood. I was baffled. <laughs> this newfound ability to instigate pandemonium hung awkwardly on my gangly frame. But I was also exhilarated. I'd stumbled on a force so much stronger than him, and it put me beyond his and the rest of that Bible Belt buckle holes, otherwise endless threats and intimidations. Thus I learned what it is to have, even if for just a moment, power, and what it is to have that in a world that has little interest in you getting your fair share on your own terms. And whether being an avid fan at scuzzy little punk shows or shouting along at mass movement protests, I support that need for my, for my friends and for my community. It is that demand for power to that voice that I nurture in the students that I now mentor and serve. And it is that vision of a just world where authority flows from truth that keeps me sane in a nation where so many wish to drag us down into that broken Oklahoma clay. It has not, however, inspired a Bliss in the Abyss reunion show, <laughs> but Trent has dropped hints. <laughs>